um, and obviously we'll give you an overview of uh, managing ITL files, but I, I want to cover a few more complex scenarios as part of uh, enhancements and uh, how to, to manage ITL files. So in terms of the agenda, we'll just run through uh, some house rules, pretty straightforward and standard things. Um, there's a very quick rundown on ourselves uh, in terms of uh, Unified FX and some of other products. Just always like to cover that just in case there's anybody kind of new uh, who isn't familiar with us. Uh, but in terms of the actual uh, content uh, for this session, uh, I'm going to cover ITL file um, overview, just give make sure everybody's familiar with ITL files are, uh, how they work and what they're about. Uh, a little bit of detail on ITL status aspects of things, understanding them just in case that prompts any questions as much as anything else. Some of the recommendations uh, that we make, uh, just to make them nice and clear. And then I'll start digging into a bit more detail how we can work with unregistered phones. Um, scenarios such as moving phones between clusters, that seems to be quite a common thing nowadays where people want to delete ITL uh, or CTL files. Um, and part of that is actually uh, setting, updating and clearing the TFTP server uh, using a macro on the phone, so I'll cover that. And we've had a couple of occasions lately where there's quite complex scenarios uh, where ITL files need to be catered for when you would think it wouldn't really be possible but because of the flexibility of a product, it still is uh, achievable. And I'll give you some examples of uh, capabilities that you can use uh, to handle those more complex scenarios if they arise. And then I'll kind of finish off with uh, hopefully a little bit of a demo and uh, keep it open for questions. But feel free to ask questions uh, at any point. In terms of those questions, uh, please uh, try to remember to submit them in the Q&A panel um, and send it to all panelists. Uh, we've got a couple of people on today who might be able to help me uh, answer some questions in case there's a few, but we'll do our best to, to catch them all and uh, respond to them. Uh, the session has been recorded, so you can email sales at unifiedfx.com uh, for their uh, details. And uh, that, that's pretty much it. Well, uh, if anything, uh, we'll try to answer the questions as they go, possibly, but we'll definitely make sure some time at the end to, to catch up. So in terms of ourselves, Unified FX, there's three main products. We'll obviously cover PhoneView in particular in terms of its ITL management capability. So, um, you know, it's used by millions of phones, are used to manage millions of phones nowadays, been around for a little while, um, certainly proven to be very powerful and very popular, Cisco compatible, et cetera, which is all great. Um, another thing, if you've never tried it and you do have a Cisco UCCX system, um, I would strongly recommend you just spend a little bit of time investigating our World FX product. It's proven to be very popular because of uh, put a lot of effort into making it really quick and simple, easy to use, very flexible uh, for the point of view you can run on effectively or the display on any device and is the fastest wallboard in terms of real time updates on the market as well. So a nice discrete product in the UCCX area. And then uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, another product that we have uh, on offer is the migration effects, which is the ability to both replace phones as well as provision phones. That's a kind of new enhancement we added lately. And uh, as well as converting phones, the, the DX endpoint between Android and CE. So pretty much anything in terms of swapping out phone configurations, um, migration effects will uh, cater for that uh, pretty much all automatically as well. So, get into a bit more detail and specifically covering effectively what ITL files are. So, they stand for Initial Trust List. Um, this is effectively based on a, uh, the original security capability that Cisco built into Communication Manager, which was uh, an optional thing. Uh, so, that was back in Communication Manager version 4. And you used certificate trust lists, you used a USB token to generate those trust lists. And those trust lists install on the phone, and it's part of that PKI uh, trust chain in terms of uh, ensuring that the phone is uh, trusted from the communication manager and vice versa, the phone can trust the communication manager. So it just locks down that uh, connectivity. But since communication manager version 8, it's not been an option anymore, um, as they call it, security by default. So now ITL files are effectively same thing as a CTL file, but rather than using a hard token, you use a soft e-token. Specifically, the TFTP server's uh, callmanager.pem file, the, the private key in there, is used to sign them. So that means that 
the ITL file itself is signed and recognizes and trusts the call manager pen file on the TFTP server, and that opens up to be able to trust other entities as long as it initially trusts um, that call manager pen file. And if all that's synchronized perfectly well, then we probably would never need to worry about deleting ITL files. But it's another thing to manage. It's something that we classify that's local to the device. It's something that um, you typically would have to go to the phone and interact with the endpoint to you know, delete, erase uh, those ITL files. But uh, some things uh, deliberately or accidentally or just through bugs, et cetera, it is unfortunately quite common for the ITL files to effectively get out of sync. And I'll obviously try and cover those scenarios uh, in more detail in a moment. But ultimately, um, but just downloading when the phone boots up. If it's a brand new phone, for example, um, it will, and it supports ITL files, that's kind of like the 7941, 7961 and above, uh, they typically all incorporate it. Um, they will automatically download an ITL file if one is available from the TFTP server. And the, the purpose of the ITL file is to allow the phone to handle secure communication, typically from an HTTPS web server, web client perspective. So it means the phone's little uh, XML browser can both browse to secure pages, HTTPS based uh, pages, which it needs to handle specific interactions for to be able to do that. And conversely, if you browse to the phone's web server, it also has the option to host its content using secure content using HTTPS. So just because that phone has to interact with those certificates as part of being a client and a server for HTTPS based content, that's the fundamental reason why an ITL file exists in the first place. But even if you, you don't care or you don't want to use secure connectivity, uh, etc., cetera, um, you don't really have an option because uh, they are there. Uh, basically, and uh, they effectively have to be. There are kind of ways to turn off uh, ITL files, but they're not recommended, not supported ultimately by Cisco, and generally will probably cause certain kind of things to break unless you know exactly what you're doing. So that's just a, a quick overview of what the ITL file is. In terms of um, some enhancements that we've done, so just to kind of summarize them, but I'll go over some of the extent the, the existing features too. And uh, so something that we've done lately, is we've added the ability to gather ITL signatures. So you may or may not be aware that we have the ability to gather ITL status using our phone view product, and I'm going to go over that in more detail in a second. But um, these are some things we added recently, um, <clears throat> which is gives you a bit more control and granularity where possible uh, on that ITL file and if it's valid and correct and in sync in effect. So what happens is when a phone uh, picks up its ITL file uh, from the phone interface, you can actually see the signature, the kind of thumbprint effectively of that ITL file. So you can kind of check that it's the right file on the phone effectively and make sure it matches the TFTP server. But that's obviously quite a cumbersome thing to go around the phones and gather that information and check it out. Uh, so one of the things that Cisco added uh, a little while ago, actually, but we hadn't really leveraged it and or told people that we'd leveraged this until recently, is on the 7800, 8800, and 9800 models, they can actually, we can actually grab that ITL signature from the phone's web server. So the way that you do that now in phone view is there's two ways. Uh, you've got this CMD colon security info command. And actually just recently, uh, we haven't published it in the production version, but we also have a query option for it as well. So you just do query and then security info is a new query option that we've added. Uh, we'll be publishing that really soon. Um, so either way, we'll allow you to grab the ITL signature. The ITL signature effectively correlates with the TFTP server. So imagine um, you grab the ITL signature information from all your phones. Imagine you've got two TFTP servers, and if you find that you've got three ITL signatures, uh, three different ones across that list of phone estate, you definitely have a problem because you only have two, and in particular, the two types of signatures that you have, or two values that you should have across that estate, they should correlate with the TFTP server that that phone effectively registered with. Um, <clears throat> or got its config from primarily. So it gives you a way to see that data, you can export it, double check it, lines up 
according to the TFTP server that, that phone is configured to use. And if you do find any discrepancies between the TFTP server and the ITL file, then those phones have a problem because their ITL file is, is out of sync. And generally speaking, when you get to that point, it's typical that you would delete the ITL file to get it back in sync again, uh, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so that's uh, quite good because it gives you a very accurate way to, for well, those models only, unfortunately, because you're a very accurate way to identify uh, any ITL discrepancies. However, uh, we did add quite a long time ago, and a couple of people have actually copied it, the ability to get the ITL status from the phone. And it's actually quite a simple thing in reality, uh, but we use a sneaky, undocumented uh, way of uh, getting it, which is uh, basically some log information from the phone. We can query that and uh, we can interpret the information from the log file and determine uh, what the ITL status of, of that handset is. Now, some enhancements we've done to that, which is actually simple stuff we should have done from day one in, in hindsight, is uh, there are some situations where we will not get an ITL status, but maybe we should do. And there's actually three situations where we won't typically get an ITL status. Uh, one is the phone doesn't support ITL files, so that's that bottom item there, no ITL for this model. Um, and uh, so that's pretty straightforward, obviously. But that was kind of open to interpretation because it we weren't explicit. It was just a blank ITL status we would show. But now we actually specifically show you that there is an ITL file, so you can ignore that uh, particular handsets. Uh, but the two new categories that have added that sort of, of greater value are the two unknown ones because there's two reasons why we might not get an ITL status. One of them is pretty straightforward, which is made, uh, that basically the phone's web server is unreachable. Now, nine times out of 10, that will be because the phone's web server is disabled. So there might be firewalls and other things as well. Uh, but there are occasions where when we're grabbing that data, that you know maybe there's been timeouts or just too many requests going out over the network, et cetera. And uh, we don't get that data back in time or, uh, or correctly or at all. So we flag that as unreachable. Now, the great thing about that is that means that even if you get, say, partial data, and maybe you've got 80% um, of your phones, you have a, an ITL status of some actual known value, um, and uh, the remaining ones might be, for example, unreachable, you can just select that subset and then requery just the subset. And you could obviously iterate, iterate your way through that to ensure you get all your ITL data, assuming obviously all the web servers are online and uh, available. So that's just a way that it makes it really simple for you to repeat that process and ensure that you've grabbed that ITL status information. Now, the reality is the way we put our software together is we try to grab as much data as we can, as simply as we can, and as accurate as we can. But there are occasions uh, on larger systems where we have a, a balance that we have to go between, which is the uh, accuracy of the data and how much data we can get and how long it takes. And that, that's quite a tricky balance because ideally we want all the information immediately, but that's just not technically possible. Uh, ideally we want everything accurately, but that could take absolutely you know, hundreds of hours on some occasions in really big networks just because of the sheer number of requests, et cetera, and different locations to go through. So uh, so we have a bit of a balance that we, 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 we kind of aim for, and that's why we have uh, the ability to re-query and get the subsets of information nice and easily. So this particular value of unreachable makes it really simple to track that down. So it means that uh, you can just go straight to uh, uh, the unreachables and you know refresh that data. So that should be a great benefit to get a kind of full coverage of, of data. And then the other one is uh, unknown with no data. And but this effectively is is uh, we've parsed the information from the phone. It is a phone that should have ITL information on it, but there is no ITL status data on that phone's web page. But we've been able to pull the data from the phone, so we'll be able to contact it. That is quite rare, but it usually means that the phone's been online for quite a long time, as in you know six months, 12 months plus, and not reset or anything like that. And other things have maybe happened, and it's kind of flushed things out the, the log on the phone, so any relevant ITL statuses are no longer in the log, because it doesn't keep too much, too many records. 
So therefore, uh, the simplest thing to effectively populate the log is quite simply to reset the phone, because when you reset the phone, one of the many things that it does, but one of the key things that it does when it resets is it updates or attempts to update that ITL file. And that's effectively what generates the ITL status on the phone. So if you ever see that particular one in our products, uh, unknown no data, just simply reset the phone and then re-query that data. And that's really the point of these two unknown statuses. It's to prompt you to you know, either do something like reset the phone or enable the phone's web server and then retry or, you know, maybe it's just unreachable. So maybe just get to some of the devices that we couldn't get to now quick enough, so to speak, and refresh that data. So that's uh, just a bit more detail on some of the recent enhancements added to phone view version 5 that we think will make uh, ITL management uh, a lot simpler uh, than it was before. In terms of just a quick summary, and I'm not going to go over all this in detail, it's mostly here for, for really reference purposes, is this is a kind of simple mapping of the different ITL statuses that you would typically see in our software, the, a brief description of you know why you would see that status message, what kind of scenarios, uh, just a little bit about it, and then any action that you might need to perform. And the key one is the fourth one down, trust list update fail. So, that's a red flag. If you ever see that, there's definitely a problem with your ITL file, and it's very straightforward. You just need to get it deleted or whatever to, to get things back on track. Typically, what happens when you delete that ITL file, it will not have an ITL file installed. So when it resets as part of that ITL delete, uh, what it will then have is its first ITL status message after the ITL file is deleted. It will typically say ITL installed because it's just been deleted. And if the phone does a subsequent reboot because it already had an ITL file and it was effectively updating it, so from that point onwards, you would then typically see plus this updated. So you can actually use that ITL install message as a crude form of confirmation that the ITL file has been uh, deleted. Uh, however, um, you know, the way that our software works, you can see all the key presses and all the interactions going out to the phones anyway, so you can kind of use that as, as confirmation, but at least from an ITL status point of view, the key thing is you want to transition from trust this update field to almost any other status effectively, you know, certainly ITL installed and trust this update. In terms of uh, recommendations, so this is really for uh, communication manager settings. Um, so this is based on, you know, experience of dealing with customer issues and, and things like that. Um, that consistently, if you follow these recommendations and you make sure everything's stable and you know that all your devices have picked up these updated changes, then it means that you've got the greatest chance to deal with any potential ITL issues that may arise accidentally uh, or, or uh, through software issues, whatever, uh, or just plain project work through moving points between clusters, etc. It gives you the absolute uh, uh, greatest chance of success. Uh, on basically all your devices, assuming they pick up the configuration correctly, because um, enabling settings menu, which is on by default anyway, but some customers, not many, some customers do disable them typically on public devices. Uh, if you just that's a red flag because if you do set the settings menu to disabled, and unfortunately at any point after that the phone does pick up uh, an ITL issue, the only way to resolve that is with a factory reset. And that's not technically possible to be performed remotely. So you have to physically attend that device. The way that we gather the data and, and scanning information and phone view tries to do its best to tell you which devices that might be in that particular painful scenario that need physical remediation. But the way to try and avoid it in the first place is to make sure that your settings menu set to enabled. Even if it's just something that you do on a short term basis as part of a project, uh, but it's certainly going to save you a lot of hassle by going down that path. Enable phone ser web server, that's pretty straightforward. Nowadays, it's disabled by default. Um, generally, uh, you might just do that for a short term period if it's something that doesn't apply to your security policies, but it, it's generally valuable because of the data you get from the phone's web server anyway, as well as remote control and what screenshots and, and other kind of things. So it's generally just good to have on uh, as long as it doesn't cause you any challenges. Um, authentication URLs, this is a very important one actually, but sometimes it's uh, skipped over. 
which is the default authentication URLs and communication manager usually don't work out of the box. And there's not actually many products that actually leverage the phone's authentication mechanism. And what that's used for and its primary purpose is that if I want to access content or perform actions on that phone via its web server um, that are secured, such as taking a screenshot or pressing a button remotely, etc. Um, the phone has to authenticate that, and that's when the authentication URL is used. So in our particular case, our software by default, and I'll explain this in a bit more detail in a moment, uses CTI to communicate with the phone, so it doesn't even touch the web server, but allows it to bypass any problems with the web server being disabled or not authenticating properly. Um, but uh, we can also work with unregistered phones, which we'll cover a little bit uh, in a little moment. But in order to do that, we really need to make sure that the authentication URL is correct and valid. So to kind of ensure that that's going to always work, even when there's ITL issues or DNS issues and things like that, the two things to follow are use HTTP for instead of HTTPS for both URLs. It's obviously HTTP for the non-secure one, the default URL, but so it's more relevant to the secure URL. So you've got two fields in the enterprise parameter page, one for the standard non-secure, one field for the secure URL. The standard one uses HTTP and the secure one normally by default uses HTTPS, but it can actually be any value that you wish in there. But what we recommend is change the secure one to use HTTP because uh, your phone models or all phone models that support I, uh, ITL files and security by default, they will pull only the value from the secure field and because they will do that, they will be dependent on those ITL files and the TDS service working correctly. So by changing it to HTTP being non-secure, you break the catch-22 that you can end up getting caught into by uh, taking away that dependency. Um, so the second thing that we recommend is use an IP address instead of a host name. Um, which effectively eliminates any dependency on DNS. Some customers, that's not really a, uh, an issue, and it's a preference that they use DNS anyway, but it's just something to consider just to eliminate uh, as many external dependencies. That means that you can always access the phone's web server if you absolutely need to in order to resolve issues remotely. So going on to unregistered phones uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, I've got a diagram uh, on this slide which basically shows you phone view on the bottom left corner and normally with this kind of solid line when you send key presses uh, etc instructions to the phone which deleting ITL files would obviously be one of those kind of sequences um, what it actually does by default is it will send it to the CTI manager service on the nominated communication manager node which then relays that down through the signaling channel skinny or set to the phone which will then perform those actions obviously now, uh, that's great, it's really fast, scalable, reliable, um, but it does require that the phone's registered, uh, obviously, for, for that to happen. Uh, but what our software can do is an automatic fallback to use the phone's web server. So if PhoneView knows that the phone is unregistered, and it does that through its status field, uh, part of the information that it gathers when you perform a group update, uh, if it knows that it's unregistered or any other state other than registered, basically, it will automatically send requests using HTTP. So the same ITL delete key press, for example, will be sent to the phone, but it will send it to the phone's web server. So that means even if the phone's unregistered, we can still delete ITL files. However, it does have the dependency that the web server is enabled and that uh, it's known secure, so it will still work even if there is an ITL issue, for example. Um, and obviously we've got that dependency that the settings menu are enabled, which obviously is default. So as long as with a little bit of preparation up front, following those recommendations, um, that means from our product's point of view, we've got the fastest, most efficient way to get there using CTI. But if for any reason the phones are offline or you've got a complex migration, the phones are still got an IP address, but maybe on a different network and not registered yet, um, you can still uh, work with those devices with those prerequisites in place. Now, when it comes to moving phones between clusters, this is something that's come up quite a lot recently, probably in the last six uh, plus months, uh, we've had a number of people inquiring about 
uh, using PhoneView to delete ITL files uh, as part of moving phones between clusters. It's something that's always been possible and we've always had customers use uh, their software to help them do as part of a project scenario, but um, just seems to be more of it uh, lately, not sure why, but uh, maybe lots of good projects going on with it, but any luck. Um, but ultimately, the thing that some people sometimes get a little bit stuck with, I just want to try and make this clear, is you need to delete the ITL file from the phone after the TFTP server value is set. It might seem a little bit counterintuitive because if you just have a phone and it's registered in its TFTP server based on option 150 or manually, whatever, is pointing to the old cluster, when you delete the ITL file, it will just go straight back to that same TFTP server and immediately download the same ITL file. So when you do change option 150, it will have the ITL file from the old cluster. It will attempt to register, but it will eventually fall back and go, typically go back to the original cluster. Um, so it's a sequencing problem because what you actually want to do is make sure you get inside the phone's configuration the new TFTP server. And a way I would typically do that is I would, uh, it's not the only way, but uh, the way I'd approach that is you could do the option 150 change first before you move the phones, reboot all the phones, and effectively what will happen is they'll pick up the TFTP server from the option 150, this new cluster's TFTP server, for example, uh, they will reboot, uh, they'll attempt to register to that TFTP server, but because the ITL file on the phone is still the ITL file from the old cluster, it will reject the configuration from the new TFTP server on the new cluster, and it will basically just go back to the original TFTP server. So it might take a little, a little bit longer than normal to, to reboot and re-register, you know, or four minutes or longer. Um, <clears throat> but once it's done that, the state of the phone will be, it has the TFTP server of the new cluster, but it has the ITL file of the old cluster. So that, that's because you did the option 150 TFTP server change first, but you've still got the ITL file to delete. So you do that next. And when you delete that ITL file, the phone will again reboot, but because it has the new servers, uh, new clusters TFTP server, we'll talk to that because at this point, it now no longer has an ITL file. It will now download the ITL file from the new cluster, install that, you know, trust it because it's empty uh, on its own handset. So it'll take that brand new file uh, from the new cluster, install it, and register, and obviously move over and, and carry on from there. So it's really a sequencing thing. Just basically make sure TFTP is set first before you delete the ITL file. Uh, however, uh, and I'll go over this in a little bit more detail on, on the next slide, uh, the, because I've had a lot of people asking for this, and we had this ability under the hood uh, a while ago, but we never really uh, kind of exposed it too much. But because we've got a lot of people moving phones, we've actually uh, realized that we can use another capability of our product to make that process uh, maybe a little bit simpler and smoother in, in some situations. And that's quite simply changing the TFTP server using a macro. Because whenever you, um, through the phone interface and through our macros, change the TFTP server on a phone that supports ITL files, the phone interface actually prompts you to delete the ITL file as part of that TFTP server change. It's something that's this value quite a while ago. Uh, so we incorporate that uh, in the key sequences that are built into to phone view. And that means that you're actually doing two things in one operation. You're setting the TFTP server to the new cluster and you're deleting the ITL file in one go. That allows the phone to then immediately move over to that new cluster. And it will stay there, obviously. Uh, and what you can do, I mean, personally, I don't like leaving static TFTP configurations on phones. Some customers prefer to do it that way. Maybe infrastructure reasons they have to do it that way. Uh, and then once they've all moved over, and obviously once you're Actual option 150 is changed ideally, technically not really necessary, but it's best when you have changed your, your local TFTP setting on the network. You can then clear out that statically configured uh, TFTP and allow it just to pick up the normal network level uh, option 150, um, but it will stay registered obviously because once it reboots, uh, because it's got the, the correct ITL file, uh, that was part of the point of uh, using the, the set TFTP macro. And a particular benefit that's uh, good on you know, medium and large uh, organizations is there's no need to co coordinate with the infrastructure team because if you go with the first bullet point, uh, you need to make sure 
your infrastructure team changes option 150 first, and then you're going to reboot your phones, make sure that they've all kind of come back online again and picked up the new TTP server, and then you delete the ITL files. And that's usually something that hang, hopefully happens will uh, happen in a single change window, maybe a, a four or eight hour window over a weekend or something, typically. And, you know, when you've got those dependencies and multiple teams together, things can just take more time and effort to organize, make sure it's working okay. But um, this means by using this TATP technique, you can do it without any dependency on the infrastructure team. So you can basically move the phones first, and then after they've moved, get your infrastructure team to change the option 150 setting, and uh, you know, you're know you good to go. You can then roll that TATP setting back to its uh, default to use the network. So hopefully a few people would like to use that technique. Um, in terms of uh, if you do want to go down that path for moving phones between clusters, um, this slide here covers the, the detail of, of uh, the commands to use to do that. So we have uh, a number of model independent macros that we've uh, built over time. And uh, basically, you can select a range of devices in the product, and I'll hopefully get to show you this in the demo. Uh, they can be a mixture of models, doesn't matter. And uh, you enter one of these values, I'll explain them in a second, uh, into the command bar in uh, Boom View and send them to the selected phones. And if you use that first one, for example, that will then statically enable alt TFTP, TFTP server and move the phone over if it's obviously a different cluster, different TFTP server, all in one operation. Uh, you, just a, a point to note, uh, you do need to unlock the phone first, but we have a macro button for that as well, which doesn't actually matter about the state of the phone. So it's just really one button to unlock, let the phone uh, you know, let that finish, uh, and then send uh, these instructions over. Now, uh, the way these instructions work, and there's four of them for a reason, is the first command actually does uh, multiple things, uh, and it has a prerequisite. It enables alt TFTP, it sets the IP address of the TFTP server, TFTP server one technically, and it deletes the ITL file where relevant, uh, all in one, sequence, uh, key sequence effectively on all of that single instruction. The one thing it doesn't do is unlock the phone, as I say, so you need to do that separately with the, the macro button for that. Um, <clears throat> but that does have the prerequisite of alt TFTP being turned off. And that, if you're not aware, you can get the alt TFTP value from all your phones using PhoneView. You just do a device info uh, query, and as part of that, it determines the alt TFTP status. So you can use our software to then filter and ensure that the phone's in the right state before you send the relevant command. Uh, you can do the opposite, which is maybe what you do at the end of the sequence. Um, you've got this clear TFTP server, and all that does is toggle or turn off the alt TFTP. So again, you would only use the clear TFTP server if alt TFTP was turned on. So those two, uh, so those two instructions gonna work in opposite directions for the alt TFTP setting. And in the middle, uh, you have the ability to do an update. So the prerequisites for the update is that alt TFTP is turned on. And all this is effectively going to do is change the TFTP server one or TFTP server two's IP address. This is probably more if you're gonna leave TFTP server set statically, not so much for moving phones between clusters, but we wanted to ensure that we handled uh, all scenarios, uh, you know, not just uh, moving phones, but you know, maybe as part of a project, uh, you, you need to kind of statically move and set the TFTP server for a whole bunch of phones, uh, primary and secondary. So you can cover all that off with these uh, built-in macro commands. So uh, moving into more complex scenarios, uh, we've had uh, a number of clients. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but you probably had say you know five or six clients in the last year uh, that have had. Uh, quite complex scenarios, something along the lines of um, maybe it's a managed service uh, environment that the customer is moving from or maybe to, and it's different ownership of the uh, infrastructure or communication manager or maybe even the phones, etc. So there might be restrictions about accessing either the admin interface or just any of the configuration on the old cluster, um, maybe even the new cluster, but that's obviously less likely. Um, and uh, maybe even that when the phone moves over some change event, uh, they're isolated networks, you know, and that gets quite 
tricky uh, to work with phone moves like that because normally people then have to factor in deleting the ITL file because it will be kind of stuck trying to register with the old cluster, which may not be reachable anymore, for example, in, uh, in an isolated situation. Um, so what is always actually been in the product, but it's just to highlight the capability uh, because it's relevant to solve those kind of problems, is you can actually import IP addresses from an external source. So uh, for example, um, if we've got phone details, right, then maybe those phones are unregistered because they were on a previous cluster or maybe on the new network, but they've not been able to register the call manager yet. So it's possible they're all online, as in, you know, the web server's enabled and reachable, you can ping them and, and things like that. But um, they, they just can't register with call manager because, for example, the ITL files need deleted before they do that. Um, but maybe you've got ways, I've had some customers do this, where they can query the switches to get IP address data from the phones, et cetera. So you can take that. So if we can't get the IP address information from communication manager, which is you know, where the primary source of that data, uh, we can still get a list of all the phones if they're configured on call manager, but have a blank IP address. But you can augment the data you can get from another source and do a file import. And as long as you've got the name of the phone and the corresponding IP address, it will set the IP address inside phone view so that when we do attempt to talk to that phone, going back to the unregistered scenario, uh, because we see it's unregistered, we'll attempt to talk to the phone's web server. And obviously we need the, the IP address of the phone to be able to do that. So it means that we can still talk to the phone's web server, even if it came from an old network and we don't have any IP address information in, in call manager, as long as you can provide that data into our products. Um, obviously, the pre same prerequisites apply effectively to be able to control the phone with the web using the web server, and that's that uh, we can authenticate requests to the phone's web server. Now, actually, part of that is, uh, you know, sometimes, depending on the situation, it might be that the customer might be able to set the authentication URL on the phone whilst it was on the old cluster and point the authentication URL to the new cluster's IP address, um, okay? So that's quite a, a useful technique because if the phone's in an isolated network and it's going from one network to another, um, if the phone has an authentication URL pointing to the IP address on the new network, it just means it can't authenticate for that period of time whilst it's on the old network. But as soon as that phone's moved over to the new network, um, that authentication address will be valid. Um, but the key thing is, when an ITL file is out of sync, the phone will be locked effectively from a configuration point of view. So if you don't get that configuration the way on that handset before it moves, just the way you need it to be, so that it can authenticate, um, then it will be isolated and you won't be able to control it remotely and you're going to have to go there physically. So this, again, is all about preparation. and That's why I highlighted those uh, requirements up front, because uh, if you do set that authentication URL and then you move the phone over, when PhoneView is talking to the phone's web server, it will be able to forward that credentials to the authentication server and allow that to authenticate it. However, what we also have is uh, a small little uh, Windows service application that we put together, which we've, as with all of our products, it ends with the, the letters FX. So uh, we have a, an authentication FX service. And it's quite a simple and straightforward thing. All it basically does is uh, offload or replace uh, or allow you to bypass the normal authentication mechanism that communication manager normally provides. And uh, there's, there's valid reasons why you might use that in a production environment. But there's also useful situations when we might use it in a project scenario because that authentication service could be something that runs on the old network and you allow the phones to use it with its IP address. And then when you move the phones over, it's the same authentication uh, if it's still reachable either way. Or you have a authentication service on the new network um, with the same IP address that the phone is configured to use. Um, and that authentication service has a username and password that you set on it, which is the credentials that we uh, send to the phone. If that matches, we'll authenticate it. Uh, so it just means you can give you more flexibility and control to make sure that you can successfully authenticate to the phone's uh, web server. Some other benefits is uh, you, because the authentication effects is performing the authentication, it, it 
only has one user account that it really cares about. You don't have to have device association with the phone, which uh, can be a bit cumbersome in larger customers, you know, with the 20,000 phones and above, because if you get large estates and you know, you need to see screenshots of phones, which is obviously very useful. Um, either you have, you know, one user account with all 20,000 phones associated with it, which is fine. You know, customers do get concerned about doing that because, you know, it's a big device association, but that is perfectly fine. We do have lots of customers that do that. Uh, but it also can be a hassle just to maintain, even on a small system, all of those associations as phones come and go and things like that. Um, so it's just convenient to not have to worry about that device association. So the authentication FX service can, can help you with that. And it's dead simple. You just replace the URL uh, in the enterprise parameter page with the IP address and port number of the authentication FX service. It's dead simple to deploy. Um, and uh, there's no charge for it. It's just a, a little uh, piece of software that's available for any uh, paid up phone view customers. So uh, just uh, contact us uh, and it's available on request and we'll make it uh, uh, available to you. So uh, I'm just going to pause the recording for a second. Okay, so uh, on to the, the demo portion. I don't see too many questions at the moment. I'll maybe just come back to them, uh, any of them uh, at the end. Uh, so bear with me a little second and I'll just flip over to my demo computer. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so the thing I'm probably going to focus on, uh, just because it's new and I didn't get a chance to cover it in the last uh, session really, is TFTP server uh, updates, because I think it is important for as an option uh, when people are working with ITL files, because it's one thing to be able to get ITL information, and most people hopefully are familiar with that. I'll maybe give a quick demo of it. Uh, but we think uh, more complex scenarios when you're moving phones between clusters, we think it will be of uh, great value to work with the TFTP server approach. Um, so I'll try and show you a bit of both. So actually thinking about it, I'm going to go with the ITL status first, just to refresh everybody uh, on that. But uh, I would hope most people are aware. So on the left hand side, uh, so obviously this is PhoneView running. I've got it all set up in our lab and uh, I've got their phones on the right hand side. I've got a kind of subset of the device I'm working with. It's got a real time update so we can see the activity of those phones. If I go to the keypad, press some digits, great. I'll get remote control of uh, all these devices and it, all that good stuff's working uh, real time. Uh, on the left hand side, we've got this data explorer and if I just go down, there's lots of different categories here, um, but we've got this one here called ITL status. Now you'll notice that it doesn't have a plus because there is no ITL status data at the moment. So I've got a plus and a minus next to the models because I can expand that and see the model information. But I'm going to populate this ITL status. And it's dead simple. I can just go and select interactively, toggle, etc., control A, um, all those good things to choose the phones that want to get ITL status from. And I can perform a scan or a query. Uh, scan is kind of like a simplistic thing, just grabbing lots of data in one operation. I personally recommend and prefer to use the query because it's a bit more accurate and you know, discreet. So if I go to query, I can click properly, uh, and then ITL status, and I'll choose selected 19. So if you look in the activity log, we've got the command going out, it's grabbing the ITL status, going to the phone's web server. And if we now look on the left hand side, ITL status now has a plus symbol. So I expand that. And great news, all 19 phones that I'm working with uh, come back with trust list updated. So therefore, they're all in good shape. That's a very typical message and healthy message you would expect to see. Uh, I haven't, unfortunately, believe it or not, it's quite hard to break a phone nowadays uh, deliberately in terms of ITL. Uh, it's not impossible, but it's just quite tricky. Uh, so I don't have any broken phones at the moment to, to show you. Uh, but you would obviously just be able to then click the checkbox and filter down to a subset, you know. Uh, so for example, with this uh, enhanced uh, ITL information, if we had a, an issue getting uh, some data from some of the phones, um, the web server was unreachable, etc., we could just filter to those uh, unknown items and then select those unknown, say 10 or 20, whatever we had, and then repeat that process and then run through that to go and get that ITL data. So as you get full coverage uh, for ITL information. 
Uh, but the other feature that we added, uh, and I was mentioning uh, um, <coughs> in slides there, was the ITL status. Now, we don't have that summarised. Uh, maybe it's something we could actually, think it, add, actually add thinking about it. But uh, if we go to data view, and uh, here we are here. So we've got a big table with all the columns of information that we have available to us. And uh, there's ITL status. That's all been populated now. But to the right, we have ITL signature. So if I go into the command bar here and I do CMD security info, assuming I typed it properly, and I hit send, uh, I just realized I'm not going to get any uh, data. <laughs> Oops, uh, I forgot. It only works on the 7800, uh, 8800, 9800, so uh, and I actually filtered the 7800s. So two seconds. Yeah. Hopefully some of these are online, fingers crossed. Let me just check some. Uh, there's a, there's, there's, let's turn that off and that off. There we go. So fingers crossed these phones are online and they'll give us uh, some ITL signatures. Oh wow, that was quite fast actually. There we go. So what you could note here is that they're identical. This is a single node system, so there's obviously only one TFTP server. So if I ever saw any discrepancies, more than one ITL signature, I can just check which one is the correct one and anything else that has a different value is just bad news and needs its ITL file deleted effectively. So as I say, it's, unfortunately it's only on the newer phone models, but you know, if you are fortunate enough to have those models, then at least you have a way to more accurately uh, determine if there's um, uh, issues or not uh, with their ITL files. So I thought that was worth showing you. Uh, let me just jump back to these other phones. I, I, I do prefer these for demos because the screenshots are really nippy. There we go. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the TTP server stuff, but before I do that, I just need to refresh myself even. Uh, one of the other columns here is Alt TFTP. I've actually got one, like two phones, the looks of it that uh, I have statically set a TFTP server. We were probably testing earlier. Uh, you can sort by this column, just click on it, and I'll put all the no's and yeses group them together, obviously. So you could, uh, if you want to do setting a TFTP server, you could fill, uh, sort to all the ones and select all the ones, say no, uh, send a set operation, which is basically turning on Alt TFTP. To get this Alt TFTP information, um, just to show you, you select the phone or phones, obviously, and it's under query, device info, and I do that. Now, it's probably not going to change because I've not really done much. I think one did change at the bottom, so I was obviously testing one of them earlier, uh, and it was enabled, and it's now disabled Alt TFTP, but that's nice and quick and simple just to, to refresh that Alt TFTP status. Uh, what you can also uh, take note of uh, part of that device info query actually gets the TFTP server. Now, it's a pretty basic lab, so we've only got one TFTP server, so there's not a lot of interesting data there. But just to explain, on the left-hand side here, we have this TFTP server category, which is summarizing that TFTP server one column for you. So that's quite handy, both from an ITL signature point of view, because you correlate the two, make sure that for a particular TFTP server, all the signatures are identical, so that's useful. You can sort by ITL signature when you filter a particular TFTP server. That's a nice interactive way within our product to validate things. Um, but you can also use that to confirm if you were moving phones between clusters um, that the phone had picked up the you know new clusters TFTP server, that, that kind of idea, or if it's still stuck with the old one for whatever reason. So it's great useful information just to confirm what the phones are, are up to on mass, and, and most people should hopefully know this by this stage, but you can export all of this data, just file, export every record, the filtered uh, subset or the selected items, you know, which could be less again, um, and then do whatever kind of reporting, processing uh, with uh, phone view as well. But generally speaking, because of how we structured this data explorer, you can actually do a lot of things uh, just through clicking and selecting uh, the various summarized items on the left there. Uh, oh, didn't realize the time. Uh, <laughs> I thought this would only take 45 minutes, but sometimes uh, I get a little bit carried away with my demos. So let me jump back to the screen view and I'll just show you the uh, macros in action. So what I'm gonna do, let's just on a couple for, I'm gonna go out risky and uh, you know, uh, it's not something I do very often. Now let me choose that row of phones. Then if I go to, 
the command bar here, I do cmd set tftp server colon the IP address, and that's basically it, right? And hopefully we'll get to see this animate and you'll see as it does the, the menu sequence, so that'll be nice. But before I send that command, because I do sometimes forget, let me just open up the settings page. Because I just want to make sure that the settings are unlocked. So what you should notice there is uh, the first five are unlocked, but that last one's locked. So that would have failed on that fifth phone, actually, if I hadn't checked that. Now, just to be aware, um, there is no way to determine the lock status of a phone uh, other than looking at the screenshot remotely like this. Um, but you can enforce a particular lock status. If you perform a hard reset, the phone will always come back in a lock state. And so once you do a hard reset and let the phones come back, you can then select the relevant phones like so. And on the toolbar, we have this lock unlock. It's just a toggle operation. So if I click that and we watch that one phone, you see opens up the settings page consistently, starts our pound effectively and unlocks the phone. So I now have all the phones in a consistent state. But I could have done that with thousands of devices in a mixture of states and by doing the hard reset, waiting till they come back online and then doing that uh, lock unlock operation, I can get them all in a consistent unlock state without looking at the screen to, to validate it. So I thought that would be relevant. Uh, okay, so now I know everything's in the right state from a, a lock status point of view. I'll select these devices and uh, assuming that <laughs> I'm, not, uh, I'm not risking myself too much, even though the settings page is open, this should still work because of the way this macro is built, it can consistently open the settings page. We'll find out in a second when I hit the button. So I've got the command here. I'm actually just typing in the same IP address as the TFTP server currently is, so the value won't change, just to save my phones going offline and waiting several minutes for them to kind of come back again. Uh, so when I hit send, hopefully if you watch carefully, you can see it's animating through, it's turning on alt TFTP, it's going into TFTP server, magically it's typing in that TFTP server value for you and immediately quickly, a uh, lot quicker it would be doing it uh, if you were in front of the phone. Uh, the phone's resetting, you see the configuring IP. This shouldn't take too long because it's just the same TFTP server. But what it would also do is delete the, the ITL file as part of uh, that change operation, uh, <clears throat> the TFTP, oh, TFTP change operation. So in theory, yeah, I think they're probably back online, probably can't really tell. Uh, oh no, I don't see the line option. Let me just press the settings button to. Maybe we're going to take it out of registering now. And the great thing is, because all the authentication and the web server set up nicely, uh, even though those phones are rebooting, uh, well, not rebooting, resetting, I suppose, you can still see what's happening remotely from a, a screenshot point of view. Looks like that last one is maybe not playing ball too well. Sometimes what can happen is the screenshot times out after 30 seconds. So if you're going to get a bad screenshot, as in, Briefly, the web server was unreachable as it was resetting. Um, it'll kind of wait 30 seconds before it tries again. So that'll kind of stay stale for a little while until it's able to successfully talk to the phone's web server again. Sometimes what can also happen um, is the phone might pick up a different IP address. Um, and obviously we need to do a group update in phone view to pick up the new IP address before the screenshots would carry on working again. Um, so that was me setting the TFTP server. Uh, let me just try and prove that out. Now, I'm not sure how reachable that last one is. I've got, got a feeling that the IP address may have changed, so may have kind of lost it for now. Uh, but if I select that row, I go back to data view, so you can see I still select here as well. So notice that it says alt TFTP no at the moment, uh, but if I refresh that and I go to query, device info, and those six selected, there you go, it says yes. So we have been able to get to that other phone still, which is good. Maybe it's just screenshots. In fact, there you go. Interesting enough, it's got 10 and a half on the PC port config. It shouldn't really cause any traffic issues, but someone's been mucking about with the settings on that phone in the lab. Um, so there we go. So it's turned Alt TFTP uh, on for those phones. It's now hard coded to that TFTP server. That could have been, obviously, your new cluster, and the phones would have then moved over for you. I'm now going to undo that and uh, clear out the alt TFTP just to do the opposite. I'll go back to here. Oh, there we go. Great. That phone's back online. It's alive again. So let's select these same phones. Um, 
just to check something and to prove it out, press the settings button. The phones are still unlocked. Except that guy, he's obviously got something strange going on. He's obviously not playing ball. He must have done some kind of full reset. So uh, worth checking, I guess, in that case. So I'm just going to toggle him to get him back online. So we can change it. And if we go to these phones again, I'm going to change this command over and I'm going to do clear TFTP command there. I might have just forgotten what it was called. Clear TFTP server. Yeah, it must be that. And so this time it's just going to turn off alt TFTP in effect. And so if I go send, see it's working its way through. Alt TFTP flicking from yes to no. I can't remember, the phone probably does a quick reset as well. Yeah, it's going to configure an IP there. So I guess it might take another few seconds to come back online. It's probably actually still queryable. So where's it even registering? I'm just going to flip back to data view. And if I now do query, device info selected again. Excellent, there we are. So they're all back to, to know. So in a very short space of time with a number of devices, I just flipped the server from a manually set TFTP server to uh, and back again to automatically set. Um, and it took me no effort at all. And I'm only doing it on six phones, but it could have been 6,000 with the same level of effort and interaction. And it wouldn't have taken that long either, uh, because if you've never really used a product at scale, just to give you an example, uh, one of our larger customers uh, has many, uh, in a single four hour change window has used this software to delete 52,000 ITL files, all possible because of the parallel queuing engine that's built into the product. So nothing can touch it in terms of uh, performance and scalability when it comes to those scenarios. So that's me in terms of demo. I'm just going to flip back to the slides just to make sure I haven't forgotten anything, which is really just Q&A with the looks of it. Um, Okay, so it looks like there's a couple of questions. I do appreciate I'm running over time. So uh, the session is recorded. If you do need to ditch, uh, I totally appreciate that. Uh, and just you know, contact us for the recording and you can listen to any little questions that come up at the end. Uh, but I'll keep going for now, uh, given that uh, we've got a couple of questions to answer. So uh, where we are. So someone's asking for the link for the recording. Uh, just to be clear, if you email sales at unifiedfx.com, we'll uh, reply back with uh, the recording link. Um, I know some people maybe had conference bridge uh, hassles. It is a PC only session, so again, you can listen to the recording to, to catch up on, in, on the audio part, certainly, which will be important. Um, how many TFTP servers are recommended to set up in a cluster? More than three subscriber pods. That's just more of a cluster design thing. Uh, it's There's a lot of uh, variables in, in that question, ultimately, but uh, you know, you would only have typically one TFTP server on a small cluster with two to maybe four uh, nodes, core nodes, for example, but usually when you're going to go above that and depending on what level of resiliency and architecture you've got, if you've got two data centers, for example, then yes, you would typically then start splitting out to, to two TFTP servers. Um, I think you can technically go to three TFTP servers. I don't know many that actually do do that, or they won't necessarily have three TFTP servers maybe active. Uh, they might have them configured and enabled, and they might have like, one as a kind of fallback for upgrades and stuff. But um, you know, to be honest, it's been a little while since I've done uh, project work, uh, so uh, I maybe need, you may need to defer to whoever your UC expert is for uh, answering that one in a bit more detail. Um, okay. Recommended number of phones for each TFTP ser or change TFTP server request. I think I understand that one. So, if we're talking about the macro inside phone view, uh, the way our software works, it automatically kind of handles all the loading and call manager for you, right? We have a, a, a sliding window concept. And what that effectively means is, although we could be doing CTI interaction with 10,000 phones, for example, we don't actively open. CTI registration with all 10,000. What we actually do is only do it with typically up to 500 and a sliding window approach. So the first 500 that we interact with, we will open up CTI registration with, then you know we'll get events and CTI activity. Uh, and that's the loading part, the, uh, the number of devices that you're actively registered with from a CTI point of view. 
Um, that's the bit that hits CUCM capacity. So we, because you get all the events for those devices whenever the user does stuff, etc. So we deliberately constrain that, and as I say, by default it's 500. And then what happens is, as soon as we get to the 501st, 502nd, 503rd device that we interact with, saying key presses to, etc., we automatically deregister. The, the oldest device that we uh, interacted with, so as a timestamp against all these interactions. So that sliding window effectively allows us to ensure we have minimal load on CUCM. But from your point of view, you could deal with the entire cluster if you want to. So in practically, so technically there is no limit, and we've architected it to allow that. Practically. I think a lot of people like to do it on a device pool basis, but there isn't really a quantity thing. It's probably more a logical segmentation than, than anything else would be my recommendation. You know, it, yes, you could do it with your entire cluster in one mouse click, which is fantastic that it's even possible, um, but it's just not really practical, you know, but it's breaking into, you know, more logical chunks that you can understand and, and work through, like device pools is, is probably the most common approach. Um, Okay, uh, so you get the value. Oh yeah, okay. So um, basically, someone's asking. Uh, so it's a really basic way to ignore ITL files and roll back to pre uh, eight point zero. Yep, absolutely. Um, I'm not sure how. I mean, I've, maybe we wouldn't really interact with those customers much. Uh, but people who basically go to pre command eight rollback. Um, you're really kind of limiting some of the functionality of the phone, and you need to make sure you know what you're doing. It's nothing really personal, nothing really wrong with it, but it might break some things un, you know, unintentionally. Um, so you, you really need to kind of understand the consequences of it. Fundamentally, when you turn that pre uh, eight uh, rollback setting on, what it effectively is doing is telling the phone to not download ITL files. Okay. And that's fine. That green, you don't have to worry about them. Uh, and it's great for moving phones between clusters as well. But the unfortunate thing is, for the phone to receive that instruction to not take an ITL file, it has to trust call manager first. Okay, so you can actually end up in a catch twenty two scenario where yes, I want to roll back the phones and disable ITL files, but I won't trust you until you delete the ITL file. Right? Not not a common thing, but. Uh, Unfortunately, when you've got large phone quantities, you know, 5,000, 10,000, et cetera, there's always stragglers, there's always things that happen, and there's always you know, the odd bunch of phones that things just don't behave correctly with. So as much as it might be okay on most of them, you may end up with a few percent of your devices which just don't take that change as you expect it to. And that's why sometimes you end up with you know, having to delete ITL files. So we're not advocating uh, that you have to delete user software and you have to delete ITL files or that you have to not or use or not use uh, the rollback stuff. Do whatever is appropriate to yourselves. All we are doing is giving you a tool that you can leverage if it's suitable to you to, to make life easier. That, that's all we're here for, really. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the, the main thing is if you do disable ITL files, HTTPS connectivity to and from the phone is basically broken when you do that. Now, that's something that wasn't available before Commander 8, so it's not really that big a deal for some people. But the reason why Cisco added it is for remote endpoints, you know, home working scenarios where you're using, you know, any connect kind of things and stuff like that, remote workers, phones out in houses and uh, connected back the way be a phone proxy and other kind of features like that. Uh, that's when it really is essential to have HPS uh, connectivity. It's just good to do as well, to be fair. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Okay, so people looking for a copy of the presentation. We'll probably we we'll probably wouldn't show the slide deck directly, but we'll certainly email sales at unifiedfx.com to, to get the uh, what do you call it? To get the, the recording. Uh, oh, yeah, I think the point is uh, extensibility no longer works. Uh, yeah, good point, uh, worth clarifying. So, yes, if you just turn pre H off, HTTPS connectivity to and from the phone breaks. And by default, your services URL, which is the page that opens for you access things like extension mobility, that is HTTPS. So that breaks immediately. So that's the consequence I was talking about that you would need to then change your URLs to be HTTP across the boards and make sure you're not using HTTPS anywhere. And if you didn't appreciate and understand that, 
by turning roll back off, uh, that's when things start start to break. You can still technically use extensibility with that service, but you need to update that uh, URL accordingly. Okay, I think we're good on questions. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Sorry, another one just missed in the chat window there. One last one is, uh, which I did try to explain, but it's fair enough if it's asked uh, to clarify it, is asking if the CMD set TATP server command deletes the ITL file. The answer is, yes, it does. It doesn't only delete the ITL file, but the phone's actually quite clever, and our macros also accommodates it, and it's quite clever too, that if the phone realizes that you're putting in a different IP address uh, than the one that's on the phone already, there's an extra option that appears on the phone asking you to confirm, choose if you want to delete the ITL file as well. So you might not have seen it in that demo there because I used the same IP address that matched the existing ITL file on the phone, but as soon as you put a different IP address in, all phone models behave differently, but uh, either they will just delete the ITL file, I think some of the 7800s do that, but some of the newer phones will give you a, a little kind of warning page that appears and give you the option to delete the ITL file or not. The macros that we have built in behind that command, they always choose to delete the ITL file. So either the phone will just do it and not ask you, uh, or else it will ask you and we will confirm uh, to, to delete. So it does do both, it changes the TATP server and at the same time deletes the ITL file. Okay, I think that's uh, all the questions answered. Really appreciate everybody's time and hang around, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, a little bit longer than I expected. Um, so please take care. Um, have a great Christmas and New Year if we don't uh, speak to you before then. I think we'll be kind of winding down a little bit. So we'll be next set of webinars will be in January, February onwards. And if you do get to Cisco Live, uh, Berlin or Las Vegas, please uh, pop by, say hello. And uh, I'm sure we've all, we'll all have some good interest in new technology to, to share by then, which I, I hope you'd uh, have some mutual appreciation for. Take care. Bye-bye.